Back in 2008, uh, the state set, up, set on this uh, initiative to really fundamentally change our energy situation uh, in the state of Hawaii. We had historically been heavily dependent on fossil fuels, uh, in particular oil, uh, and the dependency hit us hard in 2008 with the uh, steep increase in oil prices on a global basis. Uh, based on you know the fact that when we contract and purchase our fuel supplies, they're, they're tied to world market indexes. We basically had no control at that point over our cost of energy. Uh, we were sort of along for the ride, so to speak, and it was uh, not a good ride. And uh, literally overnight, it almost pushed our state economy, I would characterize, towards a recession. And it kind of, you know, combined that, that increase in oil prices combined with simultaneously with, with market collapse in the uh, uh, home market, mortgage, and, and those just, all those things combined, it was really tough for our economy. I think at that point, uh, state government, it was really uh, with foresight and, and initiative by our governor at the time, Governor Linda Lingo, uh, to partner with uh, federal uh, U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, but I think she was a key catalyst in this. And, you know, she brought together, I think, federal government interests, state government interests, and key stakeholders in the state, which included the utility company, uh, utility regulators, and other stakeholders to get together and, and really set forward a new path. Fundamentally a paradigm change. And so at that time, uh, you know, they, they set forward some goals and these were goals in terms of the amount of energy production we wanted with renewable energy. Uh, the other component of the goal was also energy efficiency improvements. And so really the target set at that time was a 70% change in uh, our energy profile. 30% reduction in energy use or energy efficiency target by reduction by 30%, and uh, you know 40% uh, of the energy that we needed to produce would be produced by renewable energy by the year 2030. So 70% change. So really, at that time, and I think even today, if you look across the United States, it's it's among the highest uh, RPS and energy efficiency targets uh, enacted into law by any state in the U.S. Very aggressive. When I, when I think about all the different elements that kind of go into a paradigm shift like that, I would say first and foremost is alignment of stakeholders, right? I, you know, I kind of mentioned uh, the various interests in play. You've got federal government, you've got state government, you've got utility company, you've got regulators. It's really hard to, to make such a dramatic and, and fundamental change in your energy direction without alignment. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, crisis can bring about alignment. Crisis is painful, but crisis is also a catalyst for change. And I think uh, that crisis, as I described in Hawaii, was, was the fundamental catalyst for alignment of stakeholders that oftentimes have historically had diverging interests. Uh, once you get alignment in those interests, I think amazing things are possible. Uh, again, not an easy path necessarily, but fundamentally required alignment of interests. Uh, and then through that alignment, I think a lot of hard work, uh, you know, requires almost a, a fundamental belief that things are possible, you know, and, and sometimes that's hard. Uh, you know, I think historically, if you've done things one way, that's what you know. Uh, it's what your comfort zone is. It's, it, you know, you, you feel the risk is manageable because it's quantified, it's understood, you know, but again, taking that step out sort of on the limb and, and believing what might be possible and then beginning that journey, I think uh, has been something that has been a key ingredient for success, right? People being pushed beyond their comfort zone, stepping out of that. Uh, and you know, in a relatively short time, I think there's been a lot of success. Uh, again, not without pain. Any kind of major change is not easy. But it, it, I think it is an illustration of what is possible uh, if you have alignment of interests and sort of a belief that change can happen. 
You know, I would say at the time in 2008 when this paradigm shift occurred, there was something called the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. Mm -hmm. And so that was, I guess, a name given to the initiative, but again, driven by, by government. Uh, quite frankly, if the government had not pushed this effort, I don't think the utility on its own at the time would have done it. Uh, I was with the utility at the time. I had responsibility for many activities at, at the company. Uh, but I think, you know, without that push by government, uh, I don't think the change would have come. So I think that that was key. Uh, at the same time, I think the company also recognized that the present path they were on was not sustainable. Uh, there's a certain amount of backlash that can occur when suddenly the cost of your, your service or your product literally doubles overnight. That was the reality of what Hawaii went through. Uh, you know, I think like any business, you need to deal with that reality. Uh, and I think the company, you know, took that head on. And, and so, you know, was there one key driver or party orchestrating it? No, I, I think I would actually kind of characterize again this alignment of interests where for multiple parties that have a, you know, an objective, those interests align and together they can move forward uh, for the change. Just having, you know, worked in the industry that long and understanding how power systems and grids work and <clears throat> the economics in it, as I sat there and I thought about, how can we reach this target? Uh, and quite frankly, I think the target was quite an aspirational target. Uh, but like anything, then you start on the journey and, and you kind of have to shed maybe some of your, your prior beliefs and thinking about what what can be done or what can't be done and just try to explore it. I mean, open up your mind and, you know, it, it's amazing what people can do uh, when they have alignment and they put in the effort. And again, crisis, I think, sometimes uh, is, is really the, the catalyst to change. You know, why it's interesting in that, uh, I'd say from a technology and application standpoint, there are many aspects of Hawaii with uh, being an island uh, state in the U.S. I think our, our demographics, our, our resources, our environment are quite reflective of many places in, in the Asian Pacific region, whether they are other island uh, nations throughout the Pacific as well as through many places in, in Asia where power grids are also on islands, like through Indonesia, etc., and and even in, in larger uh, other countries that are developing, in which their power systems may be, uh, you know, isolated, small pockets of power system. There's a lot of similarities there that I think again lessons from the Hawaii experience can be taken and applied in those locations as part of their solution sets. Uh, I think again this this idea of alignment of interests. How do you get government, business? Uh, you know, regulators together, a common theme. Frankly, for the utility, for them to get on board this, there, there needed to be some fundamental changes in the regulatory uh, aspects of how utility business was, was, is handled in the U.S. and in Hawaii. And so that was all part of the package. At the end of the day, there was an agreement signed between the state, utility company, and regulators that set forward the framework on how to move forward. Uh, and that was really critical, right? They needed to, you needed to find that common ground in which, you know, people could share the success, right? When you have a, a push of direction in which there are winners and losers, it's hard to maintain alignment, right? And, and so I think that was key. Uh, so I would say some of those kinds of lessons could be maybe some of the biggest things to take to other places, right? Each solution and in, in each location needs to be tailored I think in terms of, you know, whether I use this technology and that resource, so those are all, you know, pieces that got to get tailored. But some of the big takeaways, I think, is alignment, uh, figuring out common interests, how you can share success between stakeholders. Uh, maybe those are the biggest lessons. The fact that the cost of energy can be quite expensive in the traditional way of producing energy if using fossil fuels, actually creates an opportunity for change, 
right? Uh, you know, one of the biggest motivating factors of change is, is, is there an economic reason to, to change your path? And I think that was the case in Hawaii and is the case in many island and isolated locations where the cost of energy, if it's being provided by fossil fuel, burning diesel fuel, it can be very expensive. Well, that now makes renewable energy resources uh, quite attractive. You can do a lot when you're competing against a price that's quite expensive, right? If your cost of energy is quite low, what's your motivating factor? Uh, so I think that that can be quite strong in, in isolated island developing communities. Uh, I think the other aspect of, of maybe islands and in the developing countries is quite interesting is that, you know, when you take infrastructure that's in a developed country, you have to kind of work with what's in place there already. And there's a lot of investment there. Uh, in some regards, it's an opportunity that maybe islands and other developing places can leverage is that, you know, you have an opportunity to start from a little bit of a cleaner slate, right? So what are those right decisions, what are the right policies and things you can put in place now that really will provide that foundation for you to take your energy mix and, and your, your future in a very different direction that's not as reliant on fossil fuels. You know, energy is, is so foundational to, to life and the economy, people's fundamental enjoyment of their life and, and how, you know, safety, security, health. If you trace all those things back, a lot of it comes back to energy. And so I think the APO's efforts and focus as a key pillar, I guess, of, of efforts to increase productivity, increase and improve uh, the way of life in countries, I, I think, is is actually right on target. Uh, you know, to the degree you can continue to facilitate education, knowledge share, knowledge transfer. I think those are all extremely valuable uh, activities uh, that that are fundamental again to helping uh, you know the world evolve and move to a better place. Uh, you know, I think collaboration is 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 essential. Uh, in this world today, you know, particularly in the energy markets, uh, you know, there's no one country, there's no one technology, no one company that has a solution. It's really going to be solutions from many countries, many companies, and so inherently to integrate all these pieces, you're going to have to collaborate and to the degree APO can help facilitate those collaborations across many nations and many countries and sharing of ideas, I, I think it's just going to facilitate getting to uh, the goals quicker, more efficiently. You know, I, I think, uh, I think continuing this effort to collaborate and, and bring together parties and stakeholders from many countries, uh, again, I think it's so essential because there's so many lessons learned. Uh, <clears throat> you know, th those lessons are not necessarily only going to flow from practices and ideas from developed countries to those that are undeveloped. I think there's many sort of fundamental, more indigenous practices from places that are less developed that are wonderful ideas for, for bringing about change. <clears throat> so I think APOs, again, initiatives in collaboration, uh, to me, are key to meet, meeting this future.